today's episode, we're talking to Max Rich. He's a legal expert at Republic.co who's going to lay out the groundwork for what blockchain law looks like. And it starts right now. You guys at Republic are, you know, somewhat at the forefront of all of this. How does it feel, you know, as someone who's kind of, you know, like as you mentioned, I was talking to you earlier, and you're like, you know, it's not necessarily crypto law, you know, we're still defining this thing. Um, how does it feel to just be involved in something that's so, um, you know, just being at the forefront of it? It's interesting. Um, you know, historically, new legal products come about every 20 to 30 years. Uh, we had derivatives come up 30 years ago, REITs, which are just tranches of real estate and or asset-backed securities, yeah. mortgage-backed securities, and people have to define those spaces. So it's exciting to be in, in a new space that has to be defined and be one of those people. But at the same time, there's a lot of responsibility uh, that comes along with that. Um, what we do at Republic is try to make sure that anything we do fits within current legal frameworks, not expected future legal frameworks, and that Anyone who's involved in our offerings is given full and fair disclosure, uh, basically is treated in the same way that they would hope to be treated, meaning they know what they need to know, we follow all the rules so that no one is imperiled by what we're doing, and that the companies who are offering their tokens are following best practices. So let's take it back. Um, can you paint a picture for us of where the legal and historical aspects of this have actually stemmed from? Sure. So. Um, decades before Satoshi uh, published the basically Bitcoin paperwork that started this whole craze, companies have been using cryptography for years. Um, and cryptography goes back to spy services and the like. Um, we're talking about securely storing and tracking data. Uh, there was a recent article where basically a company started in the 90s creating a timestamp on a chain and publishing that timestamp in the New York Times once a week to basically show those who held records in the chain, how the, they could access the valid timestamp and validate their data. So this is, this is old. Um, original uses, though, didn't really implicate the law. They were merely record, means of keeping records or means of securely sending data, meaning that whatever it was relevant to was what the law was relevant to. Um, the reason that this has recently implicated new laws is because we have people basically trying to sell uh, the code in these tokenized forms, and that implicates securities law, it implicates um, consumer protection laws, and it implicates uh, commodities and futures trading laws. So this is, this is where we've gone from. Um, what first really got on people's radar, though, was the use of the blockchain to sell and send money illegally. Um, Silk Road was not a blockchain venture, but many of the transactions that took place on it were done by trading Bitcoin and other crypto assets because it was seen as not traceable or a good way to hide one's uh, identity, which is kind of funny because the whole point of Bitcoin is, is that, you know, there's a, there's a database you can look to and you can say, yes, everyone validated this transaction. So technically you might be able to figure out who actually did it. Um, but that's actually what really got people interested is they said, hey, people are using this technology we're unaware of to money launder. Uh, and money laundering is always at the forefront of new technology because uh, terrorists, um, political, political dissidents, uh, drug traffickers are always looking for ways to exchange value uh, in a method that doesn't implicate our central banking system. And so that's one of the impetuses for government trying to get involved is they don't want to have this black pool or this area where people can money launder or produce illegal transactions. Um, so we're going to probably see a lot of regulation there, meaning that most of the crypto exchanges we currently see will have to register with some kind of agency. Um, most of the crypto um, exchanges we see that basically are like liquidity agents where you can trade it in for cash in the same way if you had yen, you could trade it in for US dollars. They too will have to become money services business. And the reason for that is not that government that the government doesn't want to encourage this new technology. They just don't want people funding terrorism or sending money to El Chapo. So um, it's actually, it's not that crazy and it's not that novel. <laughs> so let's start with the story. In 2016, a group of German developers launched the DAO, the Decentralized Autonomous Organization. 
The idea was that they sold ownership tokens internationally powered by Ethereum. The program governing the token sale had a recursive bug. While fixing the bug, someone exploited it. They stole $50 million worth of Ethereum. And because the losses were so great, the SEC stepped in. So the DAO is a great example of the Securities and Exchange Commission using uh, an act by third parties as a test case to teach the public about their view on, a, on an idea. Uh, the DAO was a decentralized project which offered the ability to purchase DAO tokens by really anyone using cryptocurrencies. And the thought process was you would buy a DAO token, you would have ownership in the protocol, perhaps uh, gain profits from that, but also be able to direct uh, some of what the protocol would do. And what the SEC said is, hey, these are German nationals. We can't really prosecute them easily because they're outside of our jurisdiction, even though what they did is inside of our jurisdiction. So instead of go after them, let's talk about why this is wrong and we'll prevent them from doing anything going forward. And so what the DAO laid out was um, the Howey test. And it basically said, look, people are buying something. They're buying it with the expectation of profit. Yeah, sure, maybe they'll be able to vote for what the protocol is going to do, but they're relying on third parties to run the majority of these functions. These third parties hold the majority of the DAO tokens, so they really have control, and therefore they have an expectation of profit from the efforts of others, um, others being the originators. And DAO is kind of beautiful because they basically said, look, we're going to go through the history of securities law, and we're going to show you why this offering, which was done completely online, which was not done in any traditional fashion and which wasn't registered or exempted from their uh, jurisdiction, why it's illegal. And the nice thing about the DAO is it did two things. It provided a really good education piece for people who didn't realize that uh, crypto assets were implicated by securities law, but it also went step by step and kind of gave practitioners and project creators guidance on what they need to be aware of when they're going to when they're going to sell tokens or the rights to tokens to the public. Um, and so it was a watershed moment, not because it changed anything, but because it kind of put people on notice. And it said, hey, a lot of you have been ignoring the realities of what you're dealing in. Let's set let's set the record straight and let you know how we think about this. Uh, so again, something that the commission did that uh, people should actually ultimately be grateful for. What is What's the legal definition currently of what, of what, a, what a cryptocurrency or crypto asset is? So that's a good question. Um, currently, most states and the federal government haven't actually defined what a cryptocurrency is. Uh, a few years ago, the Internal Revenue Service, the IRS, said they're property. So they basically said, if I sell you it and I make a profit, I would treat it in the same way if I sell you like my house and I made a profit off the house. So they're, they're property in a sense. Uh, what's interesting about property is, is that we have lots of different types of property. We have cars, we have stocks, we have clothing, you know, and all of these things are treated differently by the law. Uh, I can sell you a t-shirt freely, but if I want to sell you a car, we might have to go down to the DMV and get the title changed. And if I want to sell you stock or a uh, security of some kind, we'll have to go through a certain regulatory dance. So really, it's kind of open what crypto assets are. Um, the consensus at the moment is, is that most should be treated as securities. Uh, and the way you determine whether something is a security is there's a test. And the test basically says, am I buying this with the expectation of profit from a third party and I'm going to rely on that third party or other people for the rise in value? Uh, that's the Howey test. Uh, it comes from a case from over 60 years ago where they were selling the rights to orange trees. And you say, well, an orange tree is a good. You know, I can go down to a, uh, a store and buy an orange tree and plant it. Why is that a security? What happened in Howie is when you bought the orange tree, you also bought a contract. And the contract said that they would groom the tree, water the tree, pick its fruits, and sell it, and then give you the profits. So what you were really doing was you were buying an investment scheme where you owned something and you were expecting to make money off of it. Cryptocurrencies at the moment are largely like that. You're buying the right to a token or a notion of something in a protocol and you're expecting the project developers to build it and make it gain value with the hopes of arbitraging it, selling it eventually. So generally, cryptocurrencies are securities, but there are exceptions. Um, Recently, the SEC admitted that Bitcoin and Ethereum are not securities. 
and why is that? So there are two main reasons. One, Bitcoin and Ethereum really haven't been sold to people. People have mined them, people have traded for them, but there was no initial purchase by anyone. So that's number one. And the second reason is, is that the value that they derived doesn't come from any party that you can point to. The value comes from widespread adoption and use by a community. And so I believe more and more crypto assets will fall into this more like actually being considered a currency or a commodity, meaning they'll be more freely tradable and, and usable. What do, what do things look like globally, like internationally speaking? Is there a legal arms race to find the best ways to promote, you know, an adoption of cryptocurrency? Yeah, so individual states and countries are taking action, uh, creating sandboxes, which are like test periods where people can try out things with less supervision. Uh, allowing blockchain to be used for certain actions that it previously couldn't be used before. A great example is in August of 2019, Delaware will allow companies to keep their books and records on, the, on, on a blockchain, which is great. Um, so it is a bit of a legal arms race. The problem is, is that it's very inconsistent. Some, some countries are saying, hey, we want to profit off of this. We're going to invite people and basically saying, experiment, do whatever you want. Some states are principalities like Puerto Rico are doing things to attract crypto companies, but it's actually all very inconsistent. And the problem is, is that one of the promises of the blockchain or of a blockchain is, is that it will make record keeping easier, that it will make transactions more fluid and reduce operational costs. Well, we have to build off the system we currently have. We have an international banking system where basically, you know, things are a little different country to country, state to state, but overall, it's all rather aligned, and if I want to send money to Uzbekistan, it'll get there in some way or shape or form, and vice versa. So while it is an arms race, eventually there will have to be some kind of consensus, no pun intended, um, because without basically set standards that people can rely on, it'll be just various little nodes out in the distance, uh, not really working uh, together in kind of like a new environment. With that said, what, what do you think it's going to take for us to get to a place where um, it's a frictionless like adoption of, of the technology and that it's trusted and people aren't necessarily, for instance, asking what's under the hood for Facebook you know, or Instagram or social media, but what do you think it's going to take for us to get to that point? Well, so there are like two views about blockchain technology. Um, one view is this is going to be revolutionary, look at all these things we can do and it's very technical and it involves people having their hot wallets and their cold wallets and logging into complicated protocols. And I actually think we're gonna see a lot less of that in the future. What blockchain ultimately can do, at least immediately under the current rules, is be used as a record keeping mechanism and be used as a back end mechanism. A great example is currently, if I log into my Bank of America account, we have taken paper records and we've digitized them. So now I can transfer money between my checking account and my savings account. I don't see any of that. It just happens in the standard user experience that I currently enjoy. What the promise of blockchain is, is that, hey, we can make this record keeping more efficient, less prone to damage, less prone to fraud. And so if we can have that be on the back end of a lot of the things we currently enjoy, that'll bring the operational efficiencies and the reduced, uh, the reduced costs and burdens to light. It's still unclear to me how we can actually change the paradigm of how we do business today, given that we have banking laws, anti-money laundering laws, securities laws, the UCC, which is the Uniform Commercial Code, which determines how people are entitled to various debts and obligations. Um, and so we'll have to see how it develops. So the other day I received like a piece of mail from uh, Cato and there was an article in there by uh, Hester Pierce, the current SEC commissioner. Um, and it's really fascinating because um, here you have a commissioner who is a regulator um, by definition uh, talking about um, you know, being uh, prudent and very disciplined in the way that we create rules and regulations um, surrounding cryptocurrencies. And uh, that was really fascinating. One, because she really approached um, the whole topic with a lot of humility, right? So like Friedrich Hayek has the concept of the fatal conceit where 
talks about how oftentimes policymakers and rule makers um, don't have sufficient or enough information to actually design some of these rules that they're making in a productive way. Um, and in fact, you know, the unintended consequences that re as a result happen are far worse than what the original problem was, right? So that's a whole kind of like thought of behind what regulation and good and bad regulation is. Now, Hester is deemed as the crypto mom right now because she, um, you know, has uh, had public dissent over some of the rulings surrounding like Bitcoin and um, products that are connected to access with Bitcoin. And she talks about like parenting styles, like one is being a helicopter mom versus a free range mom. Um, the helicopter mom, while having very good intentions of being in control of their kids every single move um, in some way, shape or form, is trying to protect them, but in theory, and in practice um, is hurting them, you know, because they don't have like the option, you know, the, the ability to fail, right? So like failure is a huge learning lesson, like in the market, in life, you know, once we fail, we can learn how to adjust and think about like how we're affecting people and, uh, you know, in business as customers, but in like normal personal relations, it's how we're affecting our friends, et cetera, et cetera. So the free range mom, the philosophy behind that is basically like allowing your kid to explore, discover, um, find solutions, also fall when they're not doing things the right way um, and learning by way of, of doing, right? It's a more spontaneous um, and it builds trust. Like in my opinion, like I see that the difference between a helicopter mom and a, and a free range mom is one that is trying to build trust in a relationship with their kids um, because the kids will be teenagers and adults eventually, right? So um, anyways, that's one part of Hester's whole argument. Um, and it really got me to think about, you know, uh, good and bad, you know, regulation or, you know, what healthy regulation looks like and should be approached similar to what good design looks like, right? So a designer's role is to help someone achieve you know, their end goal. So the product that you're designing should in theory be helping someone accomplish that thing that they want to do. Let's say for instance, doors, right? You can either put um, a panel on there on the door to help signal like you're supposed to push the door to open it, or you can put a handle or some type of lever that signals, you know, turn it and open it up. Well, you know, similar to regulation, um, regulators should be thinking about, you know, one, do these rules help people accomplish their doors or do they create roadblocks? Um, if there was a lever and a push panel, it's kind of mixed signals, right? Like, do I push it? Do I pull it? Um, you have that phenomena called the Norman doors where you're oftentimes running into a door because you don't know if you're supposed to push or pull either because there are two, you know, there's a lever or a push panel or the door just doesn't function the way that the person intended for it to do. So connecting back the idea of design and regulation, you know, by no means am I encouraging like social engineering on um, the role of the regulators, but just to encourage, you know, design thinking in the sense that the users are oftentimes not at fault, uh, more so than the framework that has been created for them to make some of these mistakes or you know behave in a certain type of way. So when we think about um, the crypto world and regulation, I think it's super important, one, to have um, the discipline and the prudence that Hester Pierce has demonstrated and to just approach um, the whole topic with um, humility. While the world of blockchain is moving so fast that it's completely unrecognizable from last year, one thing's for sure, blockchain tech is here to stay. Till next time.